Book Five, Canto Eight of the Fairy Queen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ju. The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spenser. Book Five, The Legend of Artigall, Canto Eight. Prince Arthur and Sir Artigall free Samiant from fear. They slay the Sudan, drive his wife Adisha to despair. Nought under heaven so strongly doth allure the sense of man and all his mind possess, as beauty's lovely bait, that doth procure great warriors oft their rigour to repress, and mighty hands forget their manliness, drawn with the power of a heart-robbing eye, and wrapped in fetters of a golden tress, that can with melting pleasance mollify their hardened hearts, inured to blood and cruelty. So Wylam learned that mighty Jewish swain, each of whose locks did match a man in might, to lay his spoils before his leman's train. So also did that great Otean knight, for his love's sake his lion's skin undight, and so did warlike Antony neglect the world's whole rule for Cleopatra's sight. Such wondrous power hath women's fair aspect, to captive men, and make them all the world reject. Yet could it not stern article retain, nor hold from sweet of his avowed quest, which he had undertain to glory ain but left his love all be her strong request, fair Britomart, in languor and unrest, and rode himself upon his first intent. Nay day nor night did ever idly rest, nay white but only Talus with him went, the true guide of his way and virtuous government. So travelling, he chanced far off to heed a damsel flying on a palfrey fast before two knights that after her did speed with all their power and her full face fiercely chased in hope to have her overhent at last yet fled she fast and both them far out went carried with wings of fear like foul aghast with locks all loose and raiment all to rent and ever as she rode her eye was backward bent Soon after these he saw another knight, that after those two former rode apace, with spear in rest, and pricked with all his might. So ran they all, as they had been at base, they being chased, that did others chase. At length he saw the hindmost overtake one of those two, and force him turn his face. However loath he were his way to slake, yet mot he all gates now abide, and answer make. But the other still pursued the fearful maid, who still from him as fast away did fly, nay once for aught her speedy passage stayed, till that at length she did before her spy Sir Artigall, to whom she straight did hie, with gladful haste, in hope of him to get succour against her greedy enemy, who seeing her approach, gan forward set, to save her from her fear, and him from force to let. But he, like hound, full greedy of his prey, being impatient of impediment, continued still his course, and by the way thought with his spear him quite have overwent, so both together I like felly bent, like fiercely met. But Artigall was stronger, and better skilled in tilt and tournament, and bore him quite out of his saddle, longer than two spears' length. So mischief overmatched the wronger. And in his fall misfortune him mistook, for on his head unhappily he piped, that his own weight his neck asunder broke, and left there dead. Meanwhile the other knight defeated had the other fater quite, and all his bowels in his body brast, 
whom leaving there in that dispiteous plight, he ran still on, thinking to follow fast his other fellow pagan, which before him passed. Instead of whom, finding there ready pressed Sir Artigal, without discretion he at him ran, with ready spear in rest, who seeing him come still so fiercely on, against him made again. So both anon together met, and strongly either struck and broke their spears, yet neither has forgone his horse's back, yet to and fro long shook, and tottered like two towers, which threw a tempest crook. But when again they had recovered sense, they drew their swords in mind to make amends for what their spears had failed of their pretence. Which when the damsel, who those deadly ends of both her foes had seen, and now her friends, for her beginning a more fearful fray, she to them runs in haste, and her hair rends, crying to them their cruel hands to stay, until they both do hear what she to them will say. They stayed their hands, when she thus gan to speak, Ah, gentle knights, what mean ye thus unwise, Upon yourselves another's wrong to wreak? I am the wronged, whom you did enterprise, Both to redress, and both redressed likewise. Witness the paynims both, whom ye may see there dead on ground. What do ye then devise of more revenge? If more, then I am she, which was the root of all, End your revenge on me. Whom, when they heard so say, they looked about, To weet if it were true as she had told, Where, when they saw their foes, dead, out of doubt, Eftsoons they gan their wrathful hands to hold, And ventails rear, each other to behold. Though when, as Artigal did Arthur view, So fair a creature, and so wondrous bold, he much admired both his heart and hue, And touched with entire infection nigh him drew. Saying, Sir Knight, of pardon I you pray, That all unweeting have you wronged thus sore, Suffering my hand against my heart to stray, Which, if ye please forgive, I will therefore yield for amends Myself yours evermore, Or what so penance shall by you be read. To whom the prince, certes me needeth more to crave the same, whom error so misled, as that I did mistake, the living for the dead. But sith ye please that both our blames shall die, amends may for the trespass soon be made, since neither is endamaged much thereby, so can they both themselves full eath persuade to fair accordance, and both faults to shade either embracing other lovingly, and swearing faith to either on his blade, never thenceforth to nourish enmity, but either other's cause to maintain mutually. Then Artigal, gan of the prince enquire, what were those knights which there on ground were laid, and had received their follies worthy hire, and for what cause they chased so that maid, Certes, I wot not well, the prince then said, But by adventure found them faring so, As by the way unweetingly I strayed. And lo, the damsel's self, Whence all did grow, Of whom we may at will The whole occasion know. Then they, that damsel, Called to them nigh, And asked her, What were those two her phone? From whom she erst so fast away did fly, And what was she herself so woe-begone, And for what cause pursued of them at one? To whom she thus, Then wot ye well that I do serve a queen, That not far hence doth wone, A princess of great power and majesty, Famous through all the world, And honoured far and nigh. Her name, Mercilla, most men used to call, That is a maiden queen of high renown, For her great bounty known over all, And sovereign grace with which her royal crown She doth support, and strongly beateth down The malice of her foes, which her envy, And at her happiness do fret and frown. 
Yet she herself the more doth magnify, And even to her foes her mercies multiply. Mongst many which malign her happy state, There is a mighty man which wons hereby, That with most fell despite and deadly hate Seeks to subvert her crown and dignity, And all his power doth thereunto apply. And her good knights, of which so brave a band, Serves her as any princess under sky, he either spoils, if they against him stand, Or to his part allures, and bribeth underhand. Nay him sufficeth all the wrong and ill, Which he unto her people does each day, But that he seeks by traitorous trains To spill her person and her sacred self to slay. That, O ye heavens, defend and turn away from her Unto the miscreant himself, That neither hath religion, nor fay, but makes his god of his ungodly pelf, and idols serves, so let his idols serve the elf. To all which cruel tyranny, they say, he is provoked and stirred up day and night by his bad wife that hight Adicia, who counsels him through confidence of might to break all bonds of law and rules of right, for she herself professeth mortal foe to justice, and against her still doth fight, working to all that love her deadly woe, and making all her knights and people to do so. Which my liege lady, seeing, thought it best, with that his wife in friendly wise to deal, for stint of strife and establishment of rest, both to herself and to her commonweal, and all for past displeasures to repeal. So me and message unto her she sent, To treat with her by way of enter-deal, A final peace and fair atonement, Which might concluded be by mutual consent. All times have wont safe passage to afford To messengers that come for causes just. But this proud dame, disdaining all accord, Not only into bitter terms forth burst, reviling me and railing as she lust, but lastly to make proof of utmost shame, me like a dog she out of doors did thrust, miscalling me by many a bitter name, that never did her ill, ne once deserved blame. And lastly, that no shame might wanting be, when I was gone, soon after me she sent these two false knights, whom there ye lying see, to be by them dishonoured and shent. But thanked be God and your good hardiment, they have the price of their own folly paid. So said this damsel that hight Samiant, and to those knights, for their so noble aid, herself most grateful showed, and heaped thanks repaid. But they, now having throughly heard and seen all those great wrongs the which that maid complained to have been done against her lady queen by that proud dame which her so much disdained were moved much thereat and twixt them feigned with all their force to work avengement strong upon the Suldan's self which it maintained and on his lady the author of that wrong and upon all those knights that did to her belong but thinking best by counterfeit disguise, To their design to make the easier way, They did this complot twixt themselves devise. First, that Sir Artigall should him array, Like one of those two knights which dead there lay, And then that damsel, the sad Samiant, Should as his purchased prize with him convey Unto the Suldan's court, Her to present unto his scornful lady, That for her had sent. So, as they had devised, Sir Artigall him clad in the armour of a pagan knight, and taking with him as his vanquished thrall that damsel, led her to the Suldan's right, where soon as his proud wife of her had sight, forth of her window as she looking lay, she weaned straight it was her pain him knight, which brought that damsel as his purchased prey, and sent to him a page that mote direct his way who bringing them to their appointed place, offered his service to disarm the knight. But he refusing him to let unlace, for doubt to be discovered by his sight, kept himself still in his strange armour dight. 
soon after whom the prince arrived there and sending to the soldan in despite a bold defiance did of him require that damsel whom he held as wrongful prisoner wherewith the soldan all with fury fraught swearing and banning most blasphemously commanded straight his armour to be brought and mounting straight upon a chariot high with iron wheels and hooks armed dreadfully and drawn of cruel steeds which he had fed with flesh of men whom through fell tyranny he slaughtered had and ere they were half dead their bodies to his beasts for provender did spread so forth he came all in a coat of plate burnished with bloody rust whiles on the green the briton prince him ready did await in glistering arms right goodly well be seen that shone as bright as doth the heaven sheen and by his stirrup talus did attend playing his page's part as he had been before directed by his lord to the end he should his flail to final execution bend thus go they both together to their gear with like fierce minds but meanings different for the proud soldan with presumptuous cheer and countenance sublime and insolent sought only slaughter and avengement but the brave prince for honour and for right gainst tortuous power and lawless regiment in the behalf of wronged weak did fight more in his cause's truth he trusted than in might like to the thracian tyrant who they say unto his horses gave his guests for meat till he himself was made their greedy prey and torn in pieces by alcides great so thought the soldan in his folly's threat either the prince in pieces to have torn with his sharp wheels in his first rageous heat or under his fierce horse's feet have borne and trampled down in dust his thoughts disdained scorn but the bold child that peril well espying if he too rashly to his chariot drew gave way unto his horse's speedy flying and their resistless rigour did a stew. Yet as he passed by, the pagan threw a shivering dart, with so impetuous force, that had he not it shunned with heedful view, it had himself transfixed, or his horse, or made them both one mass, without and more remorse. Oft drew the prince unto his chariot nigh, in hope some stroke to fasten on him near, but he was mounted in his seat so high, and his wing-footed courses him did bear so fast away, that ere his ready spear he could advance, he far was gone and passed. Yet still he him did follow everywhere, and followed was of him likewise full fast, so long as in his steeds the flaming breath did last. Again the pagan threw another dart, of which he had with him abundant store on every side of his embattled cart, and of all other weapons less or more, which warlike uses had devised of yore, the wicked shaft guided through the airy wide by some bad spirit that it to mischief bore, stayed not, till through his curret it did glide, and made a grisly wound in his enriven side. Much was he grieved with that hapless throw that opened had the wellspring of his blood, but much the more that to his hateful foe he might not come to wreak his wrathful mood that made him rave like to a lion wood which being wounded of the huntsman's hand cannot come near him in the covert wood where he with boughs hath built his shady stand and fenced himself about with many a flaming brand still when he sought to approach unto him nigh his chariot wheels about him whirled round and made him back again as fast to fly and eke his steeds like to an hungry hound that hunting after game hath carrion found so cruelly did him pursue and chase that his good steed or were he much renowned for noble courage and for hardy race durst not endure their sight but fled from place to place. 
Thus long they traced, and traversed to and fro, seeking by every way to make some breach. Yet could the prince not nigh unto him go, that one sure stroke he might unto him reach, whereby his strength's assay he might him teach. At last from his victorious shield he drew the veil, which did his powerful light impeach, and coming full before his horse's view, as they upon him pressed, it plain to them did show. Like lightning flash that hath the gazer burned, so did the sight thereof their sense dismay, that back again upon themselves they turned, and with their rider ran perforce away. Nay could the soldan them from flying stay, with reins or wonted rule, as well he knew, nought feared they what he could do or say, but the only fear that was before their view, from which, like mazed deer, dismayfully they flew. Fast did they fly, as them their feet could bear, high over hills and lowly over dales, as they were followed of their former fear. In vain the pagan bands and swears and rails, and back with both his hands unto him hails the resty reins, regarded now no more. He to them calls and speaks, yet naught avails, they hear him not, they have forgot his law, but go which way they list, their guide they have for law. As when the fiery mouthed steeds, which drew the sun's bright wane to Phaeton's decay, soon as they did the monstrous scorpion view, with ugly craples crawling in their way, the dreadful sight did them so sore affray, that their well-known courses they forwent, and leading the ever-burning lamps astray, this lower world night all to ashes brent, and left their scorched path yet in the firmament. Such was the fury of these headstrong steeds, soon as the infant's sun-like shield they saw, that all obedience both to words and deeds they quite forgot, and scorned all former law. Through woods and rocks and mountains they did draw the iron chariot, and the wheels did tear, and tossed the pain him without fear or awe, from side to side they tossed him here and there, crying to them in vain, but note his crying here. Yet still the prince pursued him close behind, oft making offer him to smite, but found no easy means according to his mind. At last they have all overthrown to ground, quite topside turvy, and the pagan hound, amongst the iron hooks and grapples keen, torn all to rags and rent with many a wound, that no whole piece of him was to be seen, but scattered all about, and strode upon the green. Like as the cursed son of Theseus, that following his chase in dewy morn, to fly his stepdam's loves outrageous, of his own steeds was all to pieces torn, and his fair limbs left in the wood forlorn, that for his sake Diana did lament, and all the woody nymphs did wail and mourn, so was this Suldan wrapped and all to rent, that of his shape appeared no little monument. Only his shield and armour which there lay, though nothing whole but all to bruised and broken, he up did take, and with him brought away that mote remain for an eternal token to all, mongst whom this story should be spoken. How worthily, by heaven's high decree, justice that day of wrong herself had broken, that all men which that spectacle did see, by like ensample mote for ever warned be. So on a tree before the tyrant's door, he caused them to be hung in all men's sight, to be a monument for evermore, which when his lady from the castle's height beheld, it much appalled her troubled sprite. Yet not as women wont in doleful fit she was dismayed, or fainted through affright, but gathered unto her her troubled wit, 
and gan Efsoon's device to be avenged for it. Straight down she ran, like an enraged cow that is berobbed of her youngling dear, with knife in hand, and fatally did vow to wreak her on that maiden messenger whom she had caused be kept as prisoner by Artigal, misweaned for her own knight that brought her back, and coming present there, she at her ran with all her force and might, all flaming with revenge and furious despite. Like raging I know, when with knife in hand she threw her husband's murdered infant out, or fell Medea, when on Colchic strand her brother's bones she scattered all about, or as that madding mother mongst the rout of Bacchus priests her own dear flesh did tear, yet neither I know nor Medea stout, nor all the Menades so furious were as this bold woman when she saw that damsel there. But Artigal, being thereof aware, did stay her cruel hand, ere she her wrought, and as she did herself to strike prepare, out of her fist the wicked weapon caught, with that like one enfelon'd or distraught she forth did roam, whether her rage her bore with frantic passion and with fury fraught, and breaking forth out at a postern door, unto the wild wood ran, her dollars to deplore. As a mad bitch, when as the frantic fit her burning tongue with rage inflamed hath, doth run at random, and with furious bit snatching at everything, doth wreak her wrath on man and beast that cometh in her path. There they do say that she transformed was into a tiger, and that tiger's scath in cruelty and outrage she did pass, to prove her surname true, that she imposed hers. Then Artigal, himself discovering plain, did issue forth against all that warlike rout of knights and armoured men which did maintain that lady's part, and to the soldan lout. All which he did assault with courage stout, all were they nigh an hundred knights of name, and like wild goats them chased all about flying from place to place with coward shame, so that with final force them all he overcame. Then caused he the gates be opened wide, and there the prince as victor of that day, with triumph entertained and glorified, presenting him with all the rich array, and royal pomp which there long hidden lay, purchased through lawless power and tortious wrong of that proud Suldan, whom he erst did slay. So both for rest, there having stayed not long, marched with that maid, fit matter for another song. End of Canto 8 Book 5 The Legend of Artigal.